We're delighted to see you all today. This is part of a series of events called Endgames, uh, which is organized by RS21, a socialist, feminist, and anti-racist group in Britain. Um, Endgames is a series of monthly comradely conversations exploring crucial aspects of eco-socialism today. Uh, we're really excited to continue the series into 2022. In the coming months, we're hoping to increasingly give these events a practical edge. For example, uh, in the next couple of months, we're going to hold an event on housing, organizing and the climate crisis, and then a follow up the next month on how to build tenant and community organizations which can take action on the climate crisis. And there are many organizations like in existence, which we'll be thinking about for those. Um, uh, so as an early activity, we're always interested in what kind of events you guys would like to see held, like some of you have been coming for quite a few months now, so please do comment in the chat with ideas for events. We've also got an email address, um, which uh, we'll put at the end that you could email if you want to get involved too. Um, and yeah, so just some small pieces of housekeeping, uh, please keep yourself muted whilst not speaking. This reduces feedback and helps comrades hear each other. If you're having connection issues, try rejoining the event, switching device or internet source. We're going to start with an introduction from our speaker, which will be recorded, and then we'll stop recording and have a Q&A discussion with the aim of wrapping up around quarter past eight. So today we're hoping to explore how fossil fuels relate to modern capitalism as well as how we make the radical transition away from fossil fuels. We're delighted to be joined by Simon Perani, who's a researcher, writer and lecturer and author of Burning Up, A Global History of Fossil Fuel Consumption, um, which was published by Pluto Press in 2018. Um, and Simon's going to start the discussion. So without further ado, I will pass it to him to take it away. Thank you, Simon. OK, uh, thank you, uh, Una, and uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, attending. It's really nice to be among uh, friends and comrades, even though it's over this horrible Zoom, which we've all come to uh, sort of have a love-hate relationship with. Um, what I'm going to do is um, try to say quite a lot in quite a short time, and I'm going to do it with slides um, because I... You know, this, this. I think there's nobody here for whom this is the very first meeting they've ever been to about this stuff. So I want to try and pitch it in a way which will uh, give people some substance to talk about. But if I rush, uh, you know, we can go back during the Q and A. Um, and uh, so here we go. I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, yeah, is that is that good? Okay, so, um, oh yes, okay, so that, that, that's roughly what I'm going to talk about, ways in which fossil fuels are central to capitalism, how fossil fuels were commodified, um, the way in which they're produced and consumed through technological systems. I'm going to then say very quickly a bit about the politics of technologies, because I think uh, that's something we need to uh, think about. Uh, and then talk about confronting those systems and uh, both in the short term and the longer term. So, as I said, it's a lot in a short time. Um, we don't have to look any further than uh, Kazakhstan and the events of the last couple of weeks to get a kind of microcosm of the issues uh, raised by um, the centrality of uh, fossil fuels to capitalism. Um, we see workers separated from the product of their labor. The whole thing started uh, with a protest movement in the area where oil is produced. And the, the substance of the movement was that people didn't want to suddenly be told that the price of the fuel they used in their uh, cars and uh, to heat their homes had doubled. Um, but it became very, very political. So this is just from uh, somebody who put this on Facebook, the human rights activist uh, just before the internet was cut off on the 5th of uh, January. And you can see the last, uh, well, all four demands, actually, two, three, four, and five, very, very political, particularly uh, number five, the return of the stolen money. Uh, so this is what these oil workers were demanding. 
uh, not a lot different from what uh, many of us socialists would see as uh, the, the sort of demands we would uh, embrace. Um, now, to try to go deeper into these relationships, I, I'm really going to focus on two things. The first is the way that capitalism has commodified fuels, that's oil or gas or coal, and other energy carriers. So uh, by energy carrier, I just mean something that, uh, that carries energy. So most obviously uh, in the modern day, electricity. Um, and uh, I'm also going to talk about the way that fuels and energy carriers are consumed, if that's the right word, used up by technological systems. So those are really the two big sort of uh, focuses. Um, so moving on to the point about commodification, um, the process of the growth of capitalism um, starting in Europe uh, was a process of, first of all, the commodification of labor, the turning of human creative activity into something that was bought and sold. And um, I, I, ju I just think that the, I, I've tried to emphasize on the slide there that uh, what one of the things that concerned Karl Marx about commodities was the way that by commodifying labor, capitalism uh, created this, uh, this illusion, this myth that the social relations between people were presented back to them in what he called the fantastic form of a relation between things. It was truly weird. It was like, he said it was like something outside of the natural world, something in religion, the way that uh, commodities, uh, commodity exchange was presented to the human mind when in fact what it was about was a social relation between capital and labor. Now, capital not only commodified labor, it also commodified a lot of other things, uh, including uh, fuels, uh, coal, particularly in the 19th uh, century, uh, and electricity when it came into use at the end uh, of the 19th century. These things, uh, which are taken from nature, which are part of nature, were turned into commodities uh, to be bought and sold. And uh, the, the book that uh, Una kindly mentioned that I, I, I've written it is a history of uh, the consumption of fossil fuels and it, and it looks at those uh, issues. Um, now, before I go on, I should just tell you that um, I published a, a, an article looking at this issue of uh, commodification. I hope you'll read it. And from my point of view, fantastically successful in that uh, Larry Lohman, who's a, a, a environmentalist, a socialist, who's uh, based in uh, Ecuador, uh, has long written about these issues, uh, reacted. So does, did uh, David Schwartzman, who's a, a big uh, solar power enthusiast, also a socialist in uh, the States. And uh, we've, had a, we've started a written discussion on that. And I think that's really uh, positive. And I mean, I, you'll have to read Larry's uh, points for yourself, but I mean, basically, he's saying that the concepts of energy, as they were, um, a, 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 as they were developed by uh, Lord Kelvin and James Jewell and all those people in the middle of the nineteenth century, um, were so uh, hewn to the ideas of British imperialism at that time, so intrinsic to the industrial growth. Uh, in uh, Britain at that time, that it's very, very difficult to use these concepts uh, of energy and energy services um, without uh, just repeating uh, the ideology against which uh, we're trying to fight. I, I, I don't agree with Larry, that's why we're having the discussion, <laughs> but I think his point of view is, is extremely uh, I think he's, I think it's extremely well worth having the argument and the discussion. And I think his points it, it, definitely I, I take very seriously. My point about energy services, and we'll come back to that, uh, energy services is, is an idea that was basically invented by environmentalists in the 1970s to say, look, it's not about quantities of coal or oil or gas. 
It's not about quantities of electricity. Uh, you hear all the time in these arguments about climate change, well, we're going to need a certain number of uh, terawatts of electricity. We're going to need a certain number of millions of tons of oil equivalent and so on and so on and so on. And uh, Avery Lovins, who was a completely kind of pro-capitalist thinker about these issues, but a very uh, strong environmentalist, said, well, it's, it's not uh, tons of oil equivalent that anybody wants. What they want is light in the evening and heat for their home. And that's an energy, I mean, he called it an energy service. So anyway, that's what our argument's about. Now, um, so energy as a commodified market, um, like capitalism as a whole, is not infinite and boundless and all powerful. It has limits. The first limit is that hundreds of millions of people, that most people until somewhere in the middle of the 20th century, and still a huge minority of our fellow human beings live outside uh, this system of commodified, mainly fossil fueled energy. Worldwide, for the world population, the number one source of energy in people's homes is still biofuels, seven tenths uh, in the case of countries outside the rich world. That's my attempt to quantify it. Um, it, there's not an exact correlation. This is people with access to modern forms of energy, like electricity in grey, um, people in orange with some electricity, but using biomass, which usually means wood or wood shavings, a, a brush that they've collected from the forest to cook, and people without electricity in green. And two points just to draw to your attention, in Africa on the right-hand graph, most people uh, are uh, the green bars without electricity and in the left hand graph world energy provision you can see that orange those orange uh, uh, columns are growing very rapidly uh, in the 21st century that's people with some electricity but using biomass to cook and that's hundreds of millions of people in uh, shanty towns in uh, rapidly expanding cities in uh, countries outside the rich world. And what's happening there, I mean, this in fact is a photograph from Spain, that's the only one I could find. Um, but uh, this is happening also uh, in South Africa, in Latin American countries in a massive way, is that those people coming into these shanty towns, uh, where there are mobile phones, where there is electricity, where there are all these things, they want that stuff, and they don't want to pay electricity corporations the prices that those corporations are charging. And there's been massive uh, social conflict on this in South Africa and Brazil and all kinds of other places. And that's a limit on commodification as well, just as in countries like this one, the labor movement has a history of uh, arguing for and fighting for uh, energy and other municipal services to be provided to people as a right um, through nationalized uh, companies. So uh, worldwide, there are limits put on commodification by struggle. Right, this is the next point, which is about the way that fossil fuels are both produced and consumed by and through technological systems. And I, I mean, particularly in terms of consumption, I think it's, you know, this is the answer to the kind of crude uh, environmentalist or even populationist approaches to consumption which is that, uh, you know, there's X number of people, they're all consuming uh, so much stuff, and the solution is to have fewer people uh, in, its, in its very extreme form. But it, I, I, th these ideas of consumption are very, very widespread, far beyond if it was the, the populationists. If it was just the populationists, um, it wouldn't be so much to worry about. Um, so that, 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 that's wrong in the, in the case of... Um, fuels and energy carriers that's not the way they're consumed they're consumed by these technological systems and we need to think about those systems and the way that those systems are embedded in social uh, and economic systems and just uh, again very quickly and i'm gonna by the way i'm going to leave these slides with uh, una and pete and hopefully there'll be a way of circulating them to people um i've put links in them to more stuff uh, that I've written, other people have written. So, uh, because you know, we're not going to we're not going to discuss the whole 
uh, relationship of energy and capitalism in an hour and a quarter, no matter how hard we try. So uh, this slide, it's just to draw your attention to what to sort of energy researchers is, a, is one of the basic kind of frameworks, which is that there's primary energy, which is oil as it comes out of the North Sea. There's final energy, so looking at the top row, which is petrol. So that's being that oil goes to a refinery. Uh, it, it, the petrol comes out or the tarmac comes out at the bottom of the stack, the petrol, and then at the top you get your refined, your aviation fuel and everything. Um, that's final energy. Um, that you, you put that in your car, that's the acceleration, the overcoming of the air resistance and so on, that's useful energy. And uh, the energy service then, going back to that term, the energy service is uh, getting from where you where you were to where you wanted to go so the, it's an important distinction because on the way through that system that's where most of the tons of oil equivalent most of the terawatt hours whatever you want to call them are used and particularly so the the, the production of electricity in gas-fired power stations the main way it's produced in this country for physical reasons for physical reasons to do with Carnot's law and things that physicists can explain to you, uh, the average power station efficiency is 35%. That steam you see when you drive past the power station going up into the sky, that's energy escaping, right? So energy is being, quote, consumed, unquote, all the way uh, through uh, the system. So just a quick word on production. Uh, there are people here from Scotland, you know all this better than I do. Um, uh, oil and gas production uh, started in the US, Middle Eastern countries, Russia. Um, the, 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 it's a whole technological system of itself. I think that's the point I want to make. Big technological development of the 21st century, the combination of horizontal drilling and fracturing. This led to a big increase in US production. The US is again an ex, a, a net exporter of hydrocarbons. That's a very important uh, development. Now, looking just a bit further, uh, and I'm trying to uh, remain conscious of time, a bit further at the way that the fuels go through that system. So, um, let, again, on this slide, let's just focus on that middle column. It, it, this is the UK, a bit out of date, 2013, but hasn't much changed. At 33%. Of the energy a third of the energy is used in processes so the energy industry own, own use and losses so that'll be uh, all the uh, energy that's actually used on the north sea to get the oil out of it. Uh, it a fifth is used to make the electricity but that's the steam that disappears that's not the electricity that's the steam that disappears up into the clouds four percent oil refineries blast furnaces and other uh, processes but in, then if you look at that right hand column, so where it says, OK, 19 percent is used on road transport. But in fact, most of that energy, if that's and I think we can use that term, is it's not needed um, because, you know, a, a car weighing, you know, whatever it whatever it weighs, you know, hundreds of kilos is carrying around a person, usually one uh, in most cars um who, who's who's sitting there and so you're using an enormous amount of fuel just to get that person from place to place or in a, in a probably more relevant example you heat a home well if the home's uninsulated or badly insulated like most homes that working class people <coughs> live in well most of the most of your energy just goes out the window or through the brickwork as many of you probably know only too well from your own homes so uh it, the idea of final use so you know the, the people who thought up the slogan i mean the tactics is another story we can argue about that but i mean the people who thought out the, up the slogan insulate britain that was brilliant because that's absolutely the point um if you insulated britain you'd you'd take that 21 percent that's being used on uh residential you could cut it in half or more even before you uh, move from fossil fuels to uh renewables now, people try to draw 
uh, flow diagrams. You don't have to memorize this before we start the discussion. Um, they try to draw flow diagrams to show this uh, flow through systems. So it's not me that's invented this. This has been a subject people have been researching for years. I found this one. Uh, I'll just, if you can, if I can just point out one thing on this one, on my screen, I can't see it because I, I can see four charming people who are in the meeting. Can you see the top right hand corner or not? Let's yes. Try. Yeah, I think so. You can. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, good. Um, in the top right hand corner, what you can see is that most of the energy is called rejected energy. This is by actual physicists in the States, and they're talking about the same thing that I was talking about. So if you look at electricity generation, that gray flow that's going across, that's the steam coming out the top of the power station. That's the energy which is actually lost in the course of um, converting coal or gas uh, into electricity. And you can see the other um, flows that are lost as that uh, flow from residential. I'm surprised that's actually so small. I've actually emailed the guys who made this to try and uh, start a discussion with them about how exactly they're working it out because they haven't put their methodology online. But I just think it's interesting that you know you, the rejected energy is far bigger than what they would say is uh, the energy that's getting used. Uh, no doubt somebody else would work it out differently, but it's just to give you an idea. Right. Why do these flow diagrams matter? Um, because the energy is expended, often wasted at each stage of its passage through the technological systems. Most politicians pretend that, I mean, this roughly applies to the British government. If one, we substitute renewable electricity generation for coal and gas fire generation. Two, we introduce techno fixes like electric cars. Three, we reduce consumption by final users. It's never about corporations, that one. Then they're doing something uh, about climate change. Now, these are delusions. But I think in order to combat these delusions and work out which of the technologies compatible with tackling climate change and social injustice, we all need to develop an understanding of these technological systems and the alternatives. And the paper I've just referred to at the bottom there, so these guys are proper climate scientists, they fed it all through a computer, done all their scenarios. And basically, I mean, they've done a scenario which shows that you can get to zero, not net zero, which is a joke, but real zero, you can get there by 2050, which some people, including me would say is, is too slow. But anyway, they say you can get there. And in the course of that, that throughput of energy would go down by about 40%, right? So you can just by patching up the holes, just by doing things differently, just by, you know, people get on an electric scooter instead of an SUV, whatever, all those getting the same result with less um, energy, you can do by 40%. And then you use your uh, renewables, you substitute your renewables uh, for a lot of the rest. I'm looking at my watch here. Um, I've got here an example of a uh, system of consumption, which is uh, road transport. And it's again, I've just really taken this out of um, uh, the, the research I did for the uh, book I wrote. Transport systems based on motor vehicles uh, depended on cheap oil, which became available at the start of the 20th century. And, you know, this is very, very, in terms of history, this is a very short history, right? There were cars in the States. And the, the sort of car based transport system became ubiquitous in the United States after the Second World War, 70, 80 years ago. Right. And then in a few parts of Europe, uh, they, I mean, in Spain, uh, car, cars did not become the kind of main way of getting around until about 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, this is, and many other parts of Europe, Southeast Europe, uh, other places. And then there was the story of the rising production of oil outside the rich world. I just put on there a graph. I had to, I had to check this graph about five times because I couldn't believe it. And like a lot of things in life, it, 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 you know, when you check it, it turns out to be even worse uh, than the first impression. Um, the left hand, so these pairs of columns there for 1971, 91 and 2011. The left hand column is Nigeria's entire energy use and green is hydro and other renewables. And in Nigeria's case, that includes uh, the brushwood and the wood that women go each day to collect uh, from 
the forest in rural areas in order to supply their homes. And you can see that Nigeria's own energy use is mostly that brushwood, that wood that those women are collecting. Um, and uh, that is true still in 2011. The, the right-hand columns are the uh, crude oil that's produced by uh, Nigeria, and the black is the bit that's exported to the rich world. I mean, it's, it, it's an incredible diagram. And that's a country of 200 million people, right? So that's a, a picture of colonialism. That We talked about that, roads and cars, how they became ubiquitous. We now got 200 million SUVs on the road. They're now to, and, 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 the, the, the oil companies and the car companies now talking about electric SUVs. That's going to be a great uh, weapon in the fight against climate change. Now, what I've said there about um, uh, roads, we could we we could apply that logic to, and I think we should, to other uh, technological systems, urban built environments. Um, the, I've got a friend who's is uh, working. He's given a couple of presentations. Maybe you, you could have him at one of these meetings. Even um, he, he's given a couple of presentations on the massive savings that you can make from insulation and the way that the architects are organising around this. You know, architects are workers too. Uh, have a look at the website of the Architect uh, Climate Action Network, where they're they're they're, they're putting together the documents for a, a genuinely uh, zero carbon urban environment. Electricity networks, a lot to say about them, but I won't now. Industrial systems, agricultural systems, uh, chemical fertilizers, military and aviation systems. Going back to Nigeria, um, guess who uses more uh, fuels and uh, tons of oil equivalent than the whole of Nigeria, the US Department of Defense, fancy that. Um, so I, I just wanna say a couple of things. Uh, I'm coming to the end now. I want to say a couple of things about the politics of technologies. We all know what the grumpy old men, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, said about Greta Thunberg and the way they dismissed her. What's not quite so well known is Angela Merkel's statement, which I thought was really revealing. Uh, she accused Greta Thunberg of underplay because she's actually got some credibility. Uh, Angela Merkel said, Greta Thunberg underplayed the role of technology and innovation, particularly in the field of energy, but also in the field of energy savings. And I think this is very much about the political mind in Germany, in this country, in the EU generally, it's going to be done by technology. And uh, these are the favourite ones, electric vehicles. You know, if you're in Paraguay and all the uh, electric comes from um, hydro from dams, then yes, if you switch from diesel car or petrol car to electric car, that's good. And uh, you are stopping your carbon emissions. If you're in China or India, which is kind of quite relevant because they have big populations, it's worse because you're producing the electricity from coal. Better stick with your, your petrol car or your diesel car. Uh, what uh, electric vehicles do not do is to change the transport systems in uh, rich cities in the first world where people could get around on electric scooters or bikes or they could walk or they could take the bus. And I, I, I heard on another Zoom call the other day that uh, they talk, I see there are people here from Scotland or here that there's a, a under discussion is the possibility of free public transport, fantastic. And we've got a campaign here in London against a, uh, having an extra tunnel under the Thames. Uh, and we want to try and link it up with this whole question of uh, free public transport. Right. Hydrogen. Uh, I won't go into it now, but that's another, I mean, that's a total myth. And that's being pushed on the North Sea in a big way. Carbon dioxide removal. It's also a myth because it's so energy intensive. You use so much energy uh, on these devices that are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that you'd be better just using that energy and sticking it in the uh, electricity grid and closing down your coal-fired power stations. Um, now, uh, we uh, Marxists argue among ourselves about different things, and there's been an argument about uh, techno fixes, and hopefully it'll continue. Uh, I've put up here some statements from Marxist writers on this. I think 
demanding nationalization of fossil fuel companies and turning them into direct air capture utilities should not be our central demand. I don't know where that's going. I think that's clutching at straws. I say this, I mean, the guy who's written that, Andreas Marm, I, uh, he's done a lot of terrific research about uh, the, the history of uh, fossil fuels in, in the UK. The stuff about the 19th century is fantastic. He's written on China. He's an activist. He's a great guy and all that. But I think this is, this is very, very mistaken. Um, he's saying the left has to give up its taboo, which is a blanket rejection of any talk of geoengineering. Really happy to talk about it. You know, geoengineering is big technology mobilized by big corporations and states and lunatics like Elon Musk, right? It can't be done at community level, right? Uh, so it, it carries all those dangers that nuclear power carries, um, and which uh, the most socialists have been opposing for a long time because of that. Because if something is, is tied up with the state and with the military, uh, that technology is inherently uh, a problem. My view is that technology is not neutral. Technology is shaped by the society in which it's developed. And it, so a future socialist society is not about taking hold of current technologies and just uh, nationalizing them under workers' control and all will be good. I'm afraid it doesn't work like that. Um, it's going to be a question of changing technologies. I'm not saying anything new. This was uh, the argument by Andre Gorse and others going back to the 1980s. Social movements should now embrace proven technologies that society needs and capitalism obstructs. Heat pumps, insulation, not as exciting as, you know, salting the oceans with whatever it is or, you know, putting solar panels in space to reflect back um, uh, sunlight or whatever but it works and it's being resisted uh, by the state and by capital everywhere. Now that, so, uh, I, I mean, I'll bring it to an end. You, 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 you're all active in the movement. I think fighting these things one project at a time is really important. That's some of our propaganda about the Greater London Authority's tunnel project and why we don't like it and how far their uh, projections of the emissions from transport are from projections that are actually worked out by scientists, but I won't spend time on that. Just to sort of finish up uh, in, in the book. So I, uh, I went around and gave talks about my book like this one to uh, people like you and in universities, and I would talk about the history of fossil fuels for sort of half an hour, and then at five minutes I'd say, Look, I'm not ducking the present and the future, but I'm, uh, and, and then all the questions were about the present and the future. So that tells us something. Uh, and this is what I said about the present and the future. I kind of see three ways or three sets of ways or three possible ways that things could go. One is changes to, or, and these are actual quotes, uh, so I'm sticking stubbornly by what I said in 2018. Uh, changes to or adaptations of existing technological systems that could reduce fossil fuel use rapidly. So that would be uh, replacing all those gas fired power stations with offshore wind, right? These changes could happen under capitalism potentially in very bad ways. We all know what's wrong with big wind uh, parks of, of wind. Somebody's going to go and uh, give more grief to the people of Congo as though they haven't had enough already uh, to steal the minerals uh, to use for these uh, wind farms in the rich countries. The second way, changes that amount to superseding the technological systems in their current form, including moving to fully integrated decentralized electricity networks. This would be resisted by electricity companies. I don't know whether this could happen under capitalism or not, but I, I mean, to take that particular example, decentralized electricity networks, I think it's a good idea. Um, and I think that's a promising technology. I think that helps us. You know, I, I want to live in a world where the people from the council will come around and deliver me stuff that even a you know a guy with you know all thumbs and, and no fingers like me could iron onto his own roof to collect the sunlight and uh, you know treat it as a as collective property not as a commodity so could that happen under capitalism well and the third uh, option quote the transformation of the social and economic systems that underpin the technological ones 
That means no US Department of Defense. So there you've got a big saving already, right? That means no advertising industry. It means no petrochemicals industry beyond uh, what's necessary and so on and so on. Big, big changes to the technological systems which would be brought about when it's run in the interests of people and not profit. Um, so yeah, those are the three uh, options as I see it and I'll stop there.